song that flows straight from God's heart, a song of a soul set free. By His death, the mud grace, every sin is erased through the blood shed at Calvary. I will always sing of the cross, I will sing of the blood Jesus shed.
infinite, matchless, grace that is greater than all our sin. Welcome to the 2022 Grace Conference. What an awesome day it has been. Hard to believe. Final keynote session. Boy, oh boy, it's been a great couple days. As we sing this afternoon, would you please stand and join in that same vein. They just sang, I am resolved to serve the Lord. We don't know when our life will end, but I love this song written by Fanny Crosby. Someday the silver cord will break. You know the lyrics, but then the chorus, and I shall sing, I am saved by grace. That will be the song we'll sing for all eternity. Let's open with this, saved by grace. Sing with me. Someday the silver cord will break, and I know more as now sing but oh the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. I got a question for you. Looking out over in the eyes, how many of you, that was the first time singing that song? I thought so. And I tell you what, you're missing out on a wonderful, wonderful song. Take that back to your church. Sing that song. That's the message we should be singing. Just a great, great old hymn. Let's do that first verse again. Now you'll pick it up. Let's all try it. Here we go. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. But oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the King. Let's do until then. May we be faithful until then. My heart can sing. When I pause to remember that a heartache here, it's just a stepping stone. But until then, my heart will sing. All right, let's try this one. Here we go. My heart can sing when I pause to remember.
singing. Pastor Scott. Amen. Would you please remain standing as we ask for the Lord's blessing on our final session of the conference. Lord, we're so glad to have been with our brothers and sisters in Christ from all over the world in these last few days to be able to reconnect with people maybe we haven't seen for a long time. And Father, I'm sure we've met new friends that you will keep in our, our minds and our hearts, that we can pray for each other, that we can encourage each other. As Father, this world is growing worse and worse. The, the night is growing darker and darker. We need friends more than ever. We need fellowship more than ever. We need boldness more than ever. So Father, may these things have been a result of this conference, and we love you and we thank you and help us to be a light in this dark world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Please be seated. If you enjoyed Dayspring Bible College's Sounds of Grace, the ensemble that you heard the first two songs today, uh, they would love to come to your church. If we can work it out, we want to. There's a booth that's just in the hallway right behind this wall. That's our Dayspring Bible College and Seminary booth. Somebody will be there after the service. If you'd like to schedule Sounds of Grace, uh, we will get your name and address, and we'll try to work out something where they can uh, be at your church. They do a lot of uh, traveling, and uh, they are real. They're the real deal. They love the Lord. They have great testimonies. It, it's a real encouragement. I've been able to travel with them years past, and I'm blessed when I hear these young people speaking about the Lord and what God is doing in their lives. And, of course, their, their singing is, is marvelous as well. Uh, speaking of marvelous singing, I was in Indianapolis maybe a month ago, and I heard this couple, the parents from Indianapolis, uh, uh, Indiana, Zion Unity Baptist Church, and I was so blessed with their music. We've asked them to come and sing a special for us, and then we're so excited to have Dr. Carl Ball, the highlight of my Grace Conference. I like a lot of our speakers and sessions, but Dr. Carl Ball um, is the best way to end the Grace Conference. And I hope that we can do this for another 20, 30 years with you, Dr. Ball. I don't see why not. You have the biosphere, so you should be able to live a long, long life. So let's give a big hand to the parents. to the hills. From whence cometh my help, knowing my help cometh from the Lord.
thy foot, thy foot to be moved. The Lord that keepeth me, he will not slumber nor sleep. For the Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade. Beginning his ministry as a pastor and later becoming a world-renowned creationist, Dr. Carl Baugh has remained faithful to his calling. In 1984, Dr. Baugh founded the Creation Evidence Museum to provide a foundation for biblical creation. To better the understanding of the Ark of Noah, he directed the construction of a 25-foot, 120th scale replica based on his expeditions in search of the Ark. Over the years, he has discovered and excavated 18 dinosaurs. Dr. Baugh has traveled to many countries. His most recent venture includes discovering hidden Israel with Pastor Scudder and In Grace, where he showed the world on television many amazing archaeological discoveries he was a part of. He is known around the world as the original host of creation in the 21st century. Dr. Baugh is the author of 12 books, including his latest, The Crystalline Canopy. Please welcome to the pulpit, Dr. Carl Ball. The introduction by the parents warmed my heart in a special dimension. I call those folks my blood family. Same blood of Adam, same blood of Noah, no difference, ex blood family, in that we all messed up the blood, but Jesus took care of that. Thank God for the cross. One of the members of that team, who doesn't live there, but regularly works with that family, that church, and Dr. Boyd, is Dr. Willie Dye. Dr. Willie Dye is the leading black archaeologist in America, as far as I'm concerned, around the world. Doesn't matter whether he's black, white, in between. He has 12 doctorates. And uh, some years ago, it was Father's Day, I was en route to Israel, and uh, I turned my cell phone on, and it was Willie Dye. He said, Happy Father's Day, Dad. I think of you as my father, and there's not a thing you can do about it. <laughs> I love it. I love it, absolutely. Being here, hearing the messages, hearing the song, I Am Resolved, hearing the parents continue that, that if 
we're willing, God will give us grace to do whatever he wants us to do. Being here is an experience that causes us to reflect, to reach back to youth, to childhood, to early dedication, and then to anticipate the time when we together, together, together will kneel at the feet of Jesus. And whatever crowns we may have won in being faithful, we will not wear to strut around heaven all day. Instead, we'll lay them at the feet of Jesus. At 85, I've lived through a lot of ages. I didn't know Noah. <laughs> but literally, we went to the farm one summer to visit Grandma and Grandpa. I was just a six-year-old kid. And the only transportation they had from Duffo, Texas to Dublin, Texas to get groceries was a wagon. And they said, you want to go with us to the grocery store, which is 14 miles away, or you want to stay here and play? I said, how are you going? They said, by wagon, that's all we've got. They hitched up the horse, and I sat on the front. Have you ever ridden a wagon? My bottom still hurts. You have to get there, and then you have to get back. We think of the good old days, like running water, that is, run down to the spring to get it, if you can find a spring. So, in a real sense, I've tasted a little bit of the age of the horse and buggy. Then there's the age, the jet age. I remember in San Antonio as a kid, seeing the first jet fly through the air. And that was the first jet Randolph Field and Kelly Field had, had ever entertained. I remember the announcement on the radio with the dawn of the nuclear age. And then the introduction of the space age. And then the introduction of the digital age. I remember Roe versus Wade, the infamous introduction of the age of the slaughter of the innocents. Maybe today there will be some difference. Thank God for those Supreme Court justices. Yes. who have been hounded, their lives have been threatened, their homes have been boycotted, and yet they stood firm to make a declaration, any drop of water helps when we're thirsty. And as the pastor prayed a moment ago, it's a dark hour. In fact, what is this age? Horse and buggy, nuclear, space age? Age of information, digital age, age of slaughter of the innocents. What is today? It is the age of absolute confusion. Washington has never been our hope, but they really don't know anything about what's going on. A world is in absolute confusion. One single incident can set it afire. But I have news for you. Our eyes are not on Washington. We do need to pray and get as many honorable people as are there and thank God again for those justices and their courage. We need to do everything we can. But remember, Jesus said, the night cometh when no man can work. While this is an age of incredible, incredible scientific achievement, and I hope I can get it in before the banquet tonight, but I've got to tell you, 
you know, the pastor sandwiches me right in before the banquet and I've got to stop. He knows what he's doing. But I've got to let you know that in spite of the darkness of this hour, it is a time of greater opportunity than the entire world has never been exposed to. We prayed earlier today for Dr. Arnold, dear brother, who's being examined now, maybe some more problems. January of this year, he had COVID. Two and a half weeks, he was in isolation, not only with COVID, but with fungal pneumonia. They feared for his life. So the understanding that, he just said, I'd, I'd better talk all I can because I'm accustomed to doing that, and he does it well. So the nurse finally said, you're going to have to be quiet. You're going to have to get well, to get over this, you're going to have to be still and let the medication work. He said, but I got a job to do. And it's to talk. She said, you're going to have to stop talking. He said, I'll stop talking with one consideration. On my door, you put a sign. This man can't talk. So go to his four minute website, YouTube. <laughs> She said, I'll do it just to get you to stop talking. <laughs> well, on that four-minute YouTube, I mean, preachers, are you listening? What an incredible opportunity. You can become the star of your own program. You can literally be exposed to the world. And Lord, give me grace to show you a means by which we know God works. Uh, so he said, or she, she put this, okay, what's your, what's your website? She put www, put the website up there. Watch it for four minutes. She put that on the sign. So he was quiet. So guess what? She came in the next day. She said, thank you for that website. She said, I watched it. She was the head nurse. She said, I watched it all four minutes. And I learned that I was a sinner, but there was hope. Amen. That Jesus Christ was my only hope. And I prayed, and, and I responded in faith to the Lord Jesus. I'm your sister now. And she said, that's not all. I call my daughter. She's in trouble. She and her kids are in trouble. I call them. And I had them watch your four-minute video. And, and they got saved. And Brother Arnold said they know of at least a dozen people while he was in intensive care that got saved as a result of reading that sign, watching the program. I'm trying to tell you, God is still working. The night cometh when no man can work, but until the, day, the door is shut in that tribulation, we still have opportunity. Coming here is renewal. I live debating evolutionists, being criticized by them. Every week, somebody steps up to me, somebody new, and they'll say, I, uh, I was reading on the internet, and I know what's coming. Because we have information that we have excavated firsthand that man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously, and that is the one bit of evolution, uh, evidence that the evolutionists fear most of all. So they target this. They ignore the math, they ignore the science, but this is tangible evidence that people can see, and we have some of the actual footprints, human and dinosaur footprints together in the museum. So my life's been threatened, what's new, et cetera, et cetera. So I live, and you know, last week, Brother Scudder, for the first time in half a century, last week, the thought ran across my mind. You're 85 years old. Maybe you should slow down a little bit. Now, I didn't entertain that thought, but for the first time, it scared me. It crossed my mind. I said, I've got to get to Gwinton Road. <laughs> Pastor picked me up. Here I am. And yesterday, Brother Phil Stringer was preaching on God's a jealous God, and when you promise him something, you'd better follow through. Amen. And while he was preaching, I told him later, you rang my bell. He had no idea what I was talking about. Most people have no idea what I'm talking about, anyhow. <laughs> so I said, you rang my bell. 
as he was as he was preaching, God drove me back to the time when, as an eleven-year-old kid, in a house without running water, I told you I go back a long way, without an inside restroom. When we took a bath once a week, all the kids in the same tub, one at a time. That's how far I go back. But I remember the night, and I was reminded when Dr. Stringer was preaching, I was reminded God just gripped my soul. I'd been saved a year before. God gripped my soul, and, and, and I saw red people, yellow, black, white. I saw Australians. I didn't know where that was on the map. I saw Chinese. And I yelled out to Dad, Daddy, I want to preach. And he said, go ahead and preach. So I just drifted off to sleep in one minute. It was settled. God called me to preach. And the next morning I went to see the preacher, walked all the way to church, mile and a half. We always walked all the way to church. And uh, he told me, what happened? God's called you to preach. And, and yes, God had called me to preach. And then later, I remember selecting a life verse. Amen. Amen. Now, if you don't have one, anchor one somewhere, please. Amen. And it's the Old Testament and the New Testament combined. In the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 58, verses 10 and 11. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, the only way you can do that is with Jesus. Amen. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity. No headlines, no fanfare, Amen. no applauding audience, Amen. but your light's going to rise in obscurity. And thy darkness shall be as the noonday, and the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. Now, Dr. L.T. Grantham, in whose home I lived at his request and my parents consented, explained in the Hebrew, there's a word picture. It's a picture of a skilled surgeon who takes his right hand of talent and training and instruments, takes his left hand, bears his chest, cuts his own sinew apart, lays the instruments aside, pulls it open, takes his right hand of deliberate action, reaches in, draws out his soul, and gives it. That's what it means. Amen. That's what it's going to take. Amen. And the corresponding New Testament verse is Philippians 3.10. Most people take A and B and they ignore C and D of Philippians 3.10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes. So then finally, I wrote a motto, and as Dr. Stringer was preaching, God reminded me of all of this. And I reflected back where I thought for just a fleeting moment, you're getting old, you're getting tired, maybe you should slow down. And then, God reminded me of a motto that I'd written. It's this, Lord, bring honor to yourself at my expense and send me the bill. I'll pay it. You paid mine. And I'm in it, and God didn't forget he took me at my word. And every song somehow is of some dedication, honor to the Lord Jesus, God will sustain, which means i got work to do. 
Now, I've got a big job to do right now. I've got to finish this in 40 minutes and 30 seconds. I've got to take you to the moon and back and bring evidence of creation. So let's begin with the book. Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and I've read this passage to you two or three years ago, but many others have, but let's use this as an introduction. Nothing is incidental that's written in the Word of God. God's knowledge includes everything, past, present, future. He exists in eternity. And we, every once in a while, catch on to list a little bit of his shadow. But it's like Moses on the mountain. You'll see my hinder parts. You'll see where I've been. We're not smart enough to anticipate where God's going. Even in our own lives, we may think we know, but God has a way of surprising us, and he's always right. You'll see where I've been. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we have the greatest scientific statement that human ears have ever heard. And I've mentioned this to you before, but I need to build the foundation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For those of you with an academic background, you'll recognize that here are all the six parameters of the entire physical universe in one single statement. The most profound, the only completely adequate, the only thorough explanation of universal origins right here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There, number one, there's time in the beginning. Number two, there's force. In the beginning, God, he was already there. He instituted time. Amen. It's time, force, in the beginning, God created. That's energy. This is what we find in the universe, time, force, energy. God created the heaven, that's space, and the earth, that's mass, and all together, that's composite information that is interrelated. Now the scientists are finding that you literally can't turn a finger, move a finger, without the influence, physical influence, of the gravity of the most distant galaxy that the James Webb Telescope or the Hubble Telescope can find. It's all interrelated. And I'm going to get to the moon that's interrelated to all of that. Now, in verse 16 of the same chapter, since we know that this is not only a theological book, this is an all-encompassing book. Look at verse number 16. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. Now, that's an amazing statement. And he made the stars also. Our, our astronomers and astrophysicists estimate, and it's getting bigger all the time, they estimate that we have 10 to the 25th power of galaxies. Each of those galaxies has between 500 million and a billion stars. Are you getting all of this? And he made the stars also. Just like that. God is awesome. But he made two great lights to influence us in a special way. First, of course, is the light of the sun. We're, we're aware of that. Life Physical life would not be possible, is not possible without life, the sun. Photosynthesis, we know that. We know, it, I'd spend 15 minutes, but I don't have 15 minutes. I use them up. They're already gone. But you know that human life, physical life of any dimension is not possible without the influence of the sun. And you know it's 93 million miles away. It takes eight minutes for the light to get here. Now, that's very important. You figure into this. I was sitting at a banquet in Fiji, opposite spot of the globe from Jerusalem, and sitting beside me was a professor of math and physics at UCLA, born again Christian, independent fundamentalist, King James man, by the way. He had left his post at the university and became the assistant to the pastor 
of an inner city church that cares for all people like they are and wants to take them all to heaven. And uh, she had a warm heart. So I was talking about the light that has been brought to Fiji in that experience. He said, let me tell you something about light. He said, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on light. And he said, you know, light is both a wave and a particle. I said, yes. He said, but that figures into God's program, and we're involved. You see, light can either be a wave or a particle, but as a wave, it spirals. In its path, it doesn't simply go straight, it spirals in that straight path, exposing various angles. It is a carrier wave and can carry various information and can affect its object in various ways, whether it's a particle or a wave. And he said, in my doctoral dissertation, I mentioned that in my opinion, God had created light with those two capabilities so that human experience in prayer could ask for a certain thing and God could actually change the actions physically written into the universe. God could actually change the actions of that event in answer to prayer. And I said, I'm going to pray more. That was profound. Now, let's get to the moon. So we know the sun influences us and light influences us, but the moon the moon is very special. The American space program is the only entity that got there. Werner von Braun was the father of, essentially the father of the program. He was a stoic, uh, traditional Christian Nazi who became liberated. And then I understand that somewhere out in West Texas, he was traveling and he stopped by a little church. And I think it was a little independent Baptist church. Didn't give the name, but he heard the, the gospel freely given as grace. And he trusted Jesus Christ personally. So we began to, we began to hear some of the slogans that he wrote and some of the statements that he made. There is a God. He hadn't said that before, even though he was a stoic, traditional Christian. But now he's a born-again Christian. And the man who convinced him to use liquid hydrogen in stages three, two, and three of the mighty Apollo rocket, the Saturn V rocket, to use liquid hydrogen was a Jew. Dr. Abraham Silverstein, and they opposed each other to begin with, but God used them. Now let's see if I can get you to the moon and back. There's a banquet waiting. Listen fast, okay? I've always been interested in the space program. I'll never forget standing in front of a monitor in West Texas, in Abilene, in Amarillo, the monitor showed the launch of the Mercury program, and it showed John Glenn orbiting the Earth. Little did I know that the pad foreman for that launch, who launched John Glenn, Alan Shepard, Wally Sherraw, Gus Grissom, in the Gemini program, Neil Armstrong, et cetera, et cetera, was George Baldwin, a deacon at an independent Baptist church. Little did I know, I didn't learn it until later, I became his pastor, having established a church in St. Louis. He moved there, I knocked doors, invited them. He, he became chairman of our deacon board and a very dear, close, personal friend. Little did I know that while I was watching the monitor, they were describing things. Little did I know that the press was interviewing George Baldwin live. And they said, Engineer Baldwin, this was live. I, I like live television, live radio. And they said, 
Engineer Baldwin, you are the pad foreman for the launch of America's first man orbiting the Earth. And we have a man in space right now. We know this is the greatest moment of your life. But sir, what would you say would be the second greatest moment of your life, human interest? He said, well, I hate to disappoint you. This is a great moment. The roar of the crowd, simultaneous with the blast off of the engines. America has a man orbiting the earth in space right now. Oh, it's a very exciting moment. I guess it might be uh, the second most exciting moment of my life. He said, you know, I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I'm a Sunday school teacher of a fifth grade boy Sunday school class. And my greatest excitement is to walk down the aisle with them and see them put their trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. Well, he said it. He said it. I didn't see it, but later he described it to me, and that was the joy of his moment. Later, he talked to NASA, and because we had opened Fiji as a mission field, later he put in my hands a little titanium buoyancy ball. And he said, he explained, after Gus Grissom almost lost his life in the Mercury program in Splashdown, the hatch wouldn't open right when it did fill the, uh, the capsule with water. He said, after that, he was an engineer at McDonnell Douglas, and they were the sponsors of the Gemini capsule. He said, we place little titanium balls throughout every cavity. And he said that meant that the capsule couldn't sink because they weigh very little, they take up space, etc. And uh, he gave that to me, and I gave it to the Governor General of Fiji because Gemini 3 that he had launched, the first man uh, Gemini flight, Gus Grissom and John White, and that flight and its first orbit around the Earth the, the Gemini program, it flew directly over Fiji. So there was something involved in all of this that had to do with the space program. So I made my way to St. Louis. But when uh, on the 16th of July, 1969, I was standing in my front yard in Tampa, Florida, some 50 miles away was the launch of Apollo 11. It's all flat land down there, and I could watch the launches. A little after nine that morning as I stood in my front yard, Apollo 11 went up. I saw the launch of Apollo 11 from a distance. And then, four days later, I sat inside my home with my family on television, watched as Neil Armstrong, and there were, by the way, 400,000 engineers and other people who helped to make that possible. And there were over 600 million fellow global citizens watching 600 million as Neil Armstrong stepped one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We had arrived on the moon. I got to St. Louis. The church grew rapidly. One of the families that came was Richard Grove. Richard Grove sat under the preaching for about a year, and he was very faithful on Sunday morning. He worked uh, in a science endeavor. I had no idea what was going on. I remember he came to me one day, and he said, Pastor, uh, I have listened as you've lectured on, first of all, as you've preached the Bible, then as you've lectured on scientific creation, he said, I agree 100%. And he said, I've spent the last 25 years of my life serving my country, and I'm very pleased I have. But I'd like to spend the next 25 years of my life serving my Lord. Can you use me? Boy, I wish a dozen people would come and say that. And I said, certainly, what do you have in mind? He said, I'd like to travel with you 
periodically when you're able and I'm able, as after you give the basis, then I'll confirm that with my area of expertise. And I said, that's a deal. Um, what do you do? Boy, was I stupid. He said, well, Pastor, I had my PhD at age 19. For my dissertation, I completed the Van de Graaff Linear Accelerator. My PhD is in nuclear physics. And he said, I had the privilege of isolating plutonium-238 for the first time in history. And by the way, all of that was classified. Here are the declassified documents verifying everything he said. He said, I isolated plutonium-238 for the first time in history. And uh, he said, I want to give you something. He said, my mother gave me this in my PhD program. And he said, I want to give you the scale that I used in my research. And I still have it. It's one of my treasures. He said, it's so sensitive, it will measure a dot on a piece of paper. That's pretty sensitive. I thanked him profusely, and he said, I want to loan you something. And out of his lap, he pulled a little blonde, brown oak case, about this big, with a handle on it. He put it on the desk, but he didn't take his hand off it. He said, I want to loan you this. When you lecture, you can use it. You can refer to the work that has been done to produce it. I said, well, what is it? He said, it is a radioisotopic thermoelectric generator. I said, what? <laughs> he said, it's a radioisotopic thermoelectric generator. It's a nuclear reactor. And he said, but it's safe. It's shielded perfectly. He said, I built it. I did the research. He said, there are only three of these. He said, one is on the surface of the moon, powering our instruments. The second one is on the desk of the President of the United States. And the third one is on your desk. Be careful. <laughs> oh, well, yes, yes. What are you? Okay, so I took it with me. I, I remember going to Savannah, Georgia to preach and to lecture in their school on creation science. And, uh, of course, I kept it with me at all times. Those were the days of hijacking. Some of you are old enough to remember where individuals would hijack a plane, take it to Cuba, smile, and live happily for the next 15 days. So uh, I remember getting back on the plane, and they didn't have the nice corridor there. Uh, there was a ramp. You had to walk up, and you had to stand. And so I always like to be first seated. So here I had my briefcase, and I had the nuclear reactor in my right hand. So I stepped up to the plane, stepped to the door, and the flight attendant lady said, Sir, what's that in your hand? I said, nothing but a radioisotopic thermoelectric generator. <laughs> she said, all right, come on in. <laughs> if I had told her I was holding a nuclear reactor, I would still be in jail to this very moment. So God works a lot of things out. And by the way, Richard Groves, he gave me his lifetime verse, Psalm 111.2. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. And that's what he did. He sought them out. Now, let's take a quick trip 
how do you get to the moon, first of all? How do you get there? Well, behind me is a banner. You must have a rocket capable of getting you there. And this is the mighty Saturn V rocket. That area alone weighs over five million pounds. That's stage one. Three million pounds for stages two and three. It is absolutely awesome. Werner von Braun used his technology from the V2 rockets and the design of this primarily uses kerosene and oxygen. He had learned that in his Nazi days. But then Abraham Silverstein, Dr. Abraham Silverstein, a Jewish individual, had pioneered the research on liquid hydrogen. And von Braun was afraid of it, said it won't work. But once this got off the ground, he sent a letter to Dr. Silverstein and he said, you've paved the way to the moon because you've got to have propellant well enough here is stage one. It gets us about 42 miles into space. There's liftoff, 42 miles into space, but you've got to have a booster. That's stage two. Stage two will get that, the rest of the rocket to 103 miles above the Earth, and then that stage fires another a brief time to get into a parking orbit, one and a half orbits around the Earth, and it drops off, and then you get the final stage in which in this area you have uh, the lunar, the limb, lunar excursion module, but it's tucked away, and then you have the command module here. Later, Robert Helfenstein became a part of our research team, lived in Minneapolis, he's now home with the Lord, Robert Helfenstein designed the central control system for the command module of the Apollo spacecraft. The basic instrument they used, every time I would introduce him and mention that, he would say, well, the cell phone that you have in your pocket is a hundred times more powerful than the computer that we had to get there. And the basic instrument they used was the slide rule. They didn't have the computers that we have. And this is a vintage 69 slide rule, just like all of the engineers carried in their pockets. I tried to get an Omega Speedmaster vintage 69 watch, but I couldn't find one. Uh, that's the watch they wore to the moon. Couldn't find one, and besides, I couldn't afford it if I did find it. And, and the moon is vitally important. Let's try to get there. So Robert Helfenstein designed the central control system to get us there. But once you get us there, notice this. You've got to separate the command module from the lunar module, which brings us to this fellow. I wanted to bring this to let you know how important this is. Those were brilliant engineers. I knew some of them personally. In pastoring George Baldwin, he was chairman of our deacons, and periodically from the pulpit, uh, I would say, uh, Deacon, can you get me on one of those space flights? And he'd call back and say, I'm working on it. Uh, and I would say, well, and someone totally unqualified, unprepared. I think it would be an example for American Enterprise if you could get me on one of those space flights. And he said, I'm working on it. But I said that one time too many. So I said it one time in the pulpit, and he was up near the front. He smiled, got up, walked up to the platform, and he said, Pastor, I've been working on it, but we got a problem. It's a weight problem. Then he turned around and walked off. I mean, that, that settled it. But uh, the main engineer working on the final design of the lunar module is a man named Engineer Ham. His son is Richard Ham. 
You know Rick Ham. Engineer Ham was an agnostic. He refused to listen to anything about the Bible. His son, Rick, Richard, told me not long ago, he said, my dad, as an agnostic, uh, the landing on the moon, he said, I was outside in the front yard in New York because it was Drummond, and he said, I was outside riding my tricycle. And he said, my dad came out and said, son, I want you to come in and see this. You won't understand it now, but later you'll appreciate it. He said, I helped build the lunar module that Neil Armstrong has just landed on the moon. And he said, I want you to know that. And he said, Rick tells me later, reflecting on it, I appreciate it so much. But his dad wouldn't listen to the gospel. They moved back to Oklahoma. Rick came down to the museum. We had a, just a rough, crude uh, video of the creation model that we had made. And Rick saw it, and he said, I want my dad to see that. And he took him, took it to his dad, and his dad watched it. And his dad said, well, I guess there is a God. And one week later, his dad on a mercy mission, flying a helicopter, a river had flooded, someone was drowning. He flew the helicopter too close to the power lines, was down, and he was dying. A passerby pulled him out, and Mr. Ham, I don't know his first name, said, you know, I believe there's a God. And the passerby said, I know there is, and I know his son. Would you like to? Yes. And he gave him the gospel there as he was dying in his helicopter, and he won him to Jesus Christ. It all fits together if you let God have his way. Amen. And one of the things they did, you may not know, but the walls of this unit, this is the energy propulsion unit. This is the unit that flies back up to connect with this unit. I bought this, but I knew I had to give this sermon lecture, so I made this. I, uh, I contacted one of our model makers, and I said, I've got to have a lunar module. I've got to have it. What did he charge me to make one? And he said, he thought, called me the next day. He said, it's going to cost $850 because he said, I have to do this and that and that. I said, oh, no, no, I don't have them. So I made this. And at 85, I was really proud of it. I mean, every dimension. Here are the pods that sank just slightly. Uh, here is the release. That goes back to the command module. This is the propulsion unit and the landing. And so I was very proud of it. It's perfect in every detail. Well, I guess I better confess, I bought a Lego model <laughs> and built it out of Legos. But I was so proud. I, I didn't know those kids were having so much fun with Legos. And, and I, was, I was, you know, at, at 85, I, I was proud. Besides, it said on the box, this is for advanced individuals. So, oh, you know, so I, I put it together. I was so proud of it. But last Sunday, Father's Day, We'd been invited over to the home of one of our engineers, and his grandkids were there. So as, as the meal was being prepared, I was fellowshipping with the kids, and uh, so they said, uh, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Chicago. I'm going to lecture on how to get to the moon and get back. If I can never finish this, I'm going to lecture on that. And I built, uh, I was talking to an eight-year-old kid. I said, I built a, a lunar module. The kid said, my older brother did too. <laughs> I said, your older brother built one of these out of Legos? He said, yeah. It was advanced Legos. 
Oh my. Every time you get a little proud, something happens. So, so I said, which brother is it? He said, it's the one in the other room there, the one playing the cello. Uh, so I went in, in the next room, and there was his older brother playing the cello. And I said, I understand that you built an advanced Lego lunar model. And he said, yeah. And I also built the entire advanced Saturn V system with the command module, the escape hatch, and all three sec I mean, he, he named it, he, he nailed it, all three sections of propulsion. I said, the advanced for me? He said, the advanced? Yes. I said, how old are you? He said, I'm 10. <laughs> Under my breath, I said, I'm going back to digging dinosaurs. <laughs> but, but let's get to the moon. All right. So they disconnected from the command module. They were headed to the surface of the moon four minutes and 31 seconds into that descent. A flashing light, 1202, 1202, flashing light. Neil Armstrong radioed to Houston. Uh, I've never seen that signal. We didn't rehearse this. What's 1202? There was silence. Krantz, the director in Houston, had never known of that. They were descending to the moon, and the computer was messed up. A 26-year-old engineer who helped write the program said, it's an override signal. There are too many, there's too much information getting into the computer. It's going to shut down. Push the override button. So confidently, they said to Neil Armstrong, push the override button. He pushed the button, and the light went out, and they continued to descend. Wonderful. Whew. And then they got to the point to land. But they were four miles off because of the computer malfunction. Just two of you there. And Neil Armstrong, he was brilliant, reflective. Neil Armstrong saw that they were landing in a crater. They didn't practice that. There were huge boulders, and if they landed to any askewed angle, that's it. You're not going to get back to the command module, and you're surely not going to get back home. Neil Armstrong took the control from the computer, from the computer with 30 seconds of fuel left. He touched down and said, the eagle has landed. It was that tenuous. But that's not all. They were on the moon for 20 hours, 37 minutes. They'd collected 50 pounds of rocks and lunar soil. They had slept a bit, just a bit. <laughs> the hatch was closed, pressurized again. It's time to go home. But they looked at the switch. Engine engaged. There's only one engine. That's the thrust engine to get them off the moon, to release this from this. And it was not engaged. Neil Armstrong called back to Houston. Do you show the engine engage button working? No. One of them had broken it off with his backpack as they were moving around those tight quarters getting ready to go down on the surface of the moon. How are you going to get out of here? The record said for decades that the Fisher pin, the space pin that was invented just for them, was what Buzz Aldrin used to gouge that little opening until the off-on lever would work. Later, he admitted it wasn't the Fisher space pin that got all of the press. 
it was a 25 cent felt black marker. And he just, he worked and worked, and finally, all right, the light went on. They buckled up, pushed the button, and that engine that had never been tried before worked. They got back to the command module and back home. Now let me wind this thing up. I got five minutes to tell you about the evidence that they brought back. The evidence that they brought back, first of all, one of the, one of the instruments they placed there was powered by plutonium-238. Who had designed that instrument? Dr. Richard Grove. It fits together amazingly. In order for those instruments to work, that's what they did. One of the instruments they placed was called a laser ranging retro reflector, a mirror placed strategically so that from Earth with the stations that we have at every 120 degrees around the globe, they were able to shine a laser and determine if the moon is coming near the Earth or if it's receding. Well, amazingly, it is receding an inch and a half per year. It's getting away. When you calculate that, receding at an inch and a half a year, that means that according to evolutionary theory, if you take the assignment of, of the tens and hundreds of millions of years, at the time the dinosaurs roamed the earth, the moon would have been half the distance from where it is to the earth, and every single day, every 12 hours, not 24, 12 hours, the tide would wash over all of the continents and back again. The dinosaurs couldn't find a place to lay their foot. Evolution doesn't work. So that's evidence for creation. But it's better still. Neil Armstrong, as he was getting back, he was the first to get down, the last to get back in took the box that had 50 pounds of, almost 50 pounds of rocks. They were rattling around a bit as he carried it. He opened the box, took a scoop, and scooped up nine scoops of lunar soil. That's so fortunate. That kept them from rocking around. Got back. We were going to show the splashdown, but there's not time. You know we got back. You do know they got back. They got back, and in that soil, they found a little rock. It was a northite. Hmm. A northite in a different crystalline structure is found in granite. But this structure is different. The additional lunar landings showed that there are entire plateaus of this anorthite. The Japanese have been there, the Chinese, they have not been there personally, but they've had landers. The Japanese, the Chinese, the Indians, the Israelis, the Russians have all been there with landers, but were the only ones to step foot on the moon. Watch this and we'll wrap it up. The Japanese were able with, able with seismographs to measure the density on average. That anorthite is 50 kilometers deep, 30 miles deep. It's there for a purpose. What is the purpose? Hosea chapter 2 verse 22 describes Watch this. Dr. Lee Lorenzen found that pure anorthite, pure anorthite, when it energized, gives off a Hertz vibratory cycle at 528 Hertz. 528 Hertz is the Hertz that triggers the repair enzyme for the DNA. 
No wonder people live so long before the flood. No wonder the entire universe is orchestrated because Hosea chapter 2 verse 22 describes the sound of God permeating the universe, the sounds that God wants and God listens to them and they respond to each other. The evidence that the moon was created, the whole thing, before the flood, before the, uh, before the passage of time and the destruction of much of what's in the universe, at the time of the flood in judgment, before that, the moon could shine seven times brighter than it is today, than it does shine today, and with the carrier waves of light reflecting from the moon back to the earth, that helped man to live a lot longer. With that information, I think we need to just rededicate our lives to let God use us in a dimension unparalleled. And the poet said it like this, "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it hardly worth his while to waste much time on the old violin. But he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, now two, two dollars. Who will make it three? Three dollars once and three dollars twice and going and gone, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. And wiping the dust from the old violin, tightening up all the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as an angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bidding for the old violin? And he held it up with a bow, a thousand dollars, two thousand. 2,000, who'll make it three? 3,000 once and 3,000 twice and going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but someone cried, we do not quite understand what changed its worth. The man replied, it was the touch of the master's hand. And many a man is life out of with life out of tune, is battered and worn with sin, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once and going twice and going but almost gone, but the master comes. And the foolish crowd ne'er can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Let's let him touch us and let's go get him. Amen. All right. You've been to the moon and back. I want to make one of those. That is really cool. Let's be used of God. All the, the complexities that you saw on this, uh, this moonshot was nothing compared to one cell in your body. And just think about how much God cares about you. And we are worthless without him, but with him we are most valuable. Thank you very much, Dr. Carl Ball. I look forward to our next 20 years together, traveling around having fun. Uh, we have done several trips with Dr. Baugh to Israel. He's not able to go on our next trip, but we are going to Israel in late February. We host travel opportunities through In Grace Travel, and if any of you have ever dreamed of going to Israel, uh, we would love to show you that amazing place. And if you want to go with a group from your church, uh, some churches do that. They'll join in as a mini group with our group, and uh, that's a lot of fun as well. Uh, and then we have an Alaska cruise. It's a creation cruise, and we have Bruce Malone coming on that trip and Majesty Music's coming on that trip. 
And uh, that is, we moved it a year because they still have the vaccine requirement for Holland America and Canada. Part of the trip goes through Canada. So we've moved it to 2023. Do you think we'll be finally done with all of this nonsense by 2023? I hope so. So that's the plan. Uh, you can check out that, those travel opportunities at our website, ingrace.us slash travel. And it is fun. It is fun to go on these trips, and you're going to learn a lot, uh, especially Israel. Israel is just unbelievable. So we'd love to, to host you on one of those, and I know we'll be able to talk Dr. Ball into going uh, again one day. Not on the cruise. He will not go on the cruise because of uh, the, yeah, he likes nice, stable um, <laughs> land. So I get that. Uh, let me uh, thank all of our workshop speakers. We've had so many great sessions and forums. I'd like to have all of you stand. If you did a workshop, an idea forum, would you please stand right now? Uh, let's give them a huge hand. Thank you all for that. And I do remind you that those will be made available to you. The, the, most of them we were able to record and you can uh, listen to those once we uh, have them all ready. There is a banquet in uh, 14 minutes. So we are so thrilled to be able to present a, a real feast. And our chef, Ryan Fontana, has been trained by the chef, Dean Harmiel. You remember Dean Harmiel, uh, who is up in Minnesota, now retired, but he's the one that trained the White House chef. And so our food is going to be prepared amazingly by our chefs and our volunteers, our cooks. Uh, so much work has gone into this to make this very special for you. I know you'll realize that when you see it. And some of you have asked, how do you um, break even when you charge so, so little and you provide so much? We don't. We don't. So it's our gift. We, we subsidize it. We have people that support it, the Grace Conference, because we believe in grace so much. We want to we want to show you grace, and we want to show you uh, that how value, valuable you are doing the work that you do all around the world. So let me give you the menu. Uh, we have fresh mixed greens, fresh tiger tail shrimp with cocktail sauce, bruschetta chicken, pasta toscana, bone-in steamship round au jus. Now let me stop there. You, <laughs> you, you will never see this unless you're on one of those steamships back in the day. Um, this is a special order cut of meat. We used to see these of all places in Bemidji. And my dad saw these and like, look, it's like a leg of a cow. It, it's, it's huge. And they have them on a carving station and it's amazing. So dad uh, found somebody that would provide these. You have to special order them and it's just delicious. So we have that for you. Um, uh, by the way, one of these is vegetarian. I think it's the pasta Toscana. The uh, bone-in uh, steamship round is not just so you, you guys know that. I mean, maybe they make them plant-based. I don't get that. I think we need to have uh, meat-based plants if it were up to me. Okay, uh, golden mashed potatoes, roasted carrots and onion medley, fresh baked homemade rolls, and save room for dessert, the grand dessert table buffet and gelato bar. It's the only bar we have in our church is the gelato bar. So that's coming up. Uh, in just moments, parents, your children are going to enjoy a pizza dinner. They'll be much happier eating their pizza, by the way. And so they will already be doing that. Uh, please pick them up no later than 7 p.m. And you should know where to pick them up. It's in your program or in your schedule. If you don't, please talk to the, uh, the reservation table uh, and find out where you're going to need to pick up your child at 7 o'clock. Uh, this is your last chance to get the simple steps uh, half off of the Addictions Ministry startup box if you're interested in that. Uh, we will do everything we can to help you with that. Uh, the best thing that you can do, I think, to reach the community is have, an, have, have a, a place open uh, where people can come get help. We just have a road sign, and we have every, every Friday we have several people come just because of that sign. It's unbelievable how, how many people come in. They would never come to your church any other way. So let me encourage you to consider that, pray about that, simple steps. Uh, next year's conference. Okay, here are the dates, June 22nd and 23rd. The conference theme is Glorious Redemption. Glorious Redemption. Registration is now open. You have a promo code, early 23, 
And if you use that, starting now, you'll get $20 off early bird registration that expires in August. If you enjoyed the conference, would you please tell others about it? Help us spread the word. And uh, we want to encourage as many pastors and churches as we can. You can follow the Grace Conference on Facebook and share all those posts. The concert will be at 7.30, and it's going to be a blast. It's a lot of your church uh, music talent. And we have some other things planned for you. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Would you please stand? And I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Jim Serino if he would come and close us in prayer and also pray for the food. Pastor Masarino is one of our early graduates in Dayspring Bible College and Seminary, pastors of church in Bemidji, Minnesota. Wow, wasn't that awesome? How's it feel to go to the moon? <laughs> it's been an incredible uh, conference. I, I say that every year, but I don't know how they do it. I don't know how you do it. This is an incredible church, and... Uh, I thank God for all of you and your leadership. And um, let's go to our Lord in prayer. And boy, if you've never been to this, hold on to your seats. <laughs> Imagine what heaven will be like. Father God, we love you. We are so grateful for the privilege of being able to have been here to this conference. Thank you for Pastor Jim and, and his wife, Karen, and and this amazing church, uh, Lord, uh, they've greatly encouraged us. They've greatly blessed us. But most of all, Lord, it's all because of you. And uh, Father, today we've been encouraged by grace. And Lord, we give you all the glory and all the praise. We thank you for the new friends that were made. We thank you, Lord, as well that uh, you just take care of our every need. As we, as we leave this conference, I, I pray, Father, that you will see fit to use us to be fruitful for your honor and your glory. Now we ask your blessing on this amazing meal we're about to have. We thank you, Father, for all of those who work so hard to make this possible for us. So Lord, would you just bless this time together, and bless the food that we're about to receive, and we receive it with grateful thankfulness because of you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to end with Amazing Grace. I think it's an appropriate way to end. So uh, we'll have Pastor Dave come and sing Amazing Grace first and last verse. Is that okay? And then also, when you get to your tables, you should have a table number on your tag. Um, sit at your table until those that come will dismiss your table to go to the buffet so we're not all crowded up there. Uh, isn't grace amazing? Uh, let's sing out Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Sing with us, me, as we close. Amazing Grace. Enjoy the banquet. We'll see you back here for the concert.